We are really fortunate today to have some of these folks that are going to come and do a presentation. Uh, we have got a quality line up here. Stephanie Brewer Cook is the City of Knoxville's Americans with Disabilities Act coordinator. Am I correct? That's correct. She consults on the projects that the city does from all the way from the start. When the architects start, <coughs> the engineers, the builders, the guys right down to the brick and mortar, she is making sure they adhere to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Her leadership and involvement with these projects is definitely one of the prime reasons that Knoxville was recently designated an age-friendly city by the AARP. Congratulations for that. Thank you. She's a proud graduate of the University of Tennessee. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> she served on and continues to serve and chair numerous committees in Knoxville and around Knoxville for all kinds of uh, different nonprofit causes. We are very happy to have her with us here today and it's my pleasure to introduce Stephanie Brewer Cook. Thank you. This is this on all yes, oh, really? Yes. <laughs> I can't walk and chew gum and y'all want me to hold clickers and microphones. This is going to be quite entertaining. Um, I apologize. And I apologize for being late. I was, um, I was physically in the wrong location. Happens to me all the time. So I know that when um, I met Brandy at another event down in Knoxville where we were talking about Brett Approved, which is a website um, dealing with people with disabilities and how they go out as tourists and visitors and the access or lack of access that we find when we're out and about. And so we got to talking and she said that, um, you know, we get a lot of questions in our chamber where I'm at up uh, in the Sevier County area about service animals and emotional support animals. And would you be willing to come and speak to us about that? And I said, sure, you give me a microphone, I will be there. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, there are a number of laws that impact the lives of individuals with disabilities. Um, one of them you've already heard about, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and um, that is an extremely important law because it is the first civil rights law for individuals with disabilities in our country. Only took it till 1990 to happen, but it happened. Um, at the time when the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law, there were about 43 million Americans that um, identified as having a disability of some kind. That could be physical, cognitive, emotional, um, anything under the sun that is a, um, a qualifying disability. Today we have a little over 56 million Americans, which equates to one in 20 or 20%, uh, excuse me, one in five or 20% of our population. Interesting to note is how our population is changing. Every day in America, 10,000 individuals turn age 65 every single day and have been for a number of years. If you look at the screen, there's a stat there that is staggering. Between the years 2030 and 2040, people over age 65 will outnumber folks under the age of 18 for the first time in U.S. history. Who's going to be working these jobs, people? <laughs> when everybody's retiring, who's going to do the work? So when you combine people with disabilities and seniors, you are looking at the majority of our population. So it's important to talk about things that positively impact them. Another law um, is the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Disability as a covered protected class was added in 1988. Um, basically, it affects all transactions in housing from advertising to your um, mortgage lending to sale to rent to providing reasonable accommodations and modifications and it affects transient lodging as well, homeless shelters and that sort of thing. Under both of these federal laws, there is a strategic definition of disability and it's three-pronged. 
First one is a mental or physical impairment which substantially limits a major life activity. Somebody want to throw out just an example of a major life activity for anybody in the room? Walking. Walking. Grocery shopping. Grocery shopping. Driving. Driving. Working. Working. Sports. Sports. Seeing. Oh, hearing. Hearing. Seeing. Self-care and toileting, speaking, all of these things all of us do, right? <clears throat> Pretty important. So if you have a mental or a physical impairment that substantially limits you in one of those areas, you would have a disability under these laws. Another prong is a history of having such an impairment or you are regarded as having an impairment. So the federal laws as they relate to service animals and, and for, for space's sake, I'm referring to emotional support animals as an ESA. Under the ADA, and I have DOJ in parentheses because the Department of Justice is the enforcing arm of that federal law. HUD, or the Department of Housing and Urban Development, is the enforcing federal um, arm of the Fair Housing Act. Both of them require physical access to facilities, inclusive policies and programming, reasonable accommodations, and modifications to policies when necessary. There are only two questions we can ask when approached by individuals that are saying the animals they have with them are service animals. We can ask them, is that an animal or a, is that a pet, excuse me, or a service animal needed due to a disability? And if somebody says that that's a service animal needed for a disability, the only other question we can ask then is, what tasks has that animal been trained to provide for you? As a wheelchair user, I have three little pets, none of whom I'm able to train because they don't mind me well enough to be my service animal. But um, if I had, then some of the common tasks a wheelchair user would want a service animal to perform would be picking things up off the floor when I drop them, maybe pulling me um, up a hill, up a, up a steep incline, that kind of thing, opening doors for me, that kind of thing. Um, so it's important that we know there are only two questions that we can ask. Now, if you're in the housing industry, um, then you are allowed to seek medical documentation from a mental health provider or other medical provider that connects the need for the emotional support animal to the individual with a mental or psychiatric disability. But you cannot ask questions about the individual's disability um, and I wouldn't discuss it with anybody but that individual that's trying to work with you on an accommodation. So what's not required? by these laws, good or bad. As a person with a disability, I don't always agree with what the Department of Justice says we have to do with service animals and emotional support animals, but this is what the law says. They are not required to have a specific identification card or for the handler or the animal. Does not require special or specific certifications or even training programs. Does not require proof of training programs and does not require a specific vest or harness or leash or other identifier on the animal. How many times do you see an animal out in public and it's wrapped in a vest or something that says working animal, service dog, do not touch, that kind of thing. Um, that's nice to identify, I guess, from a distance that this is an animal that's not a pet and that we shouldn't approach or try to distract it, but it's not required that they have that. And if you just do a Google or a Bing search for service animals or emotional support animals, man, there are people out there getting rich quick off of get your service animal certified. Put this animal on this national registry. Get a letter from a doctor. Yes. And a letter from a doctor would be needed. But there is no registry of... Um, animals that we can all go to that would give us some sense of, okay, I understand this is a service animal, this is emotional service animal. Those don't count. Those are just, unfortunately, folks are falling for the um, get your vest and now you're legit <coughs> kind of advertising that is out there. Required by the laws, however, is the service animal must be a dog or in limited circumstances a miniature horse under the ADA. I got her to chuckle. 
I always chuckle too when I think about a miniature horse trying to come and see us at the city county building in Knoxville. I'm thinking, where's the pet relief area for that? <laughs> and who's going to deal with that? But, um, but at any rate, under the Fair Housing Act, it can really be any animal. Because there are cases when a dog or a miniature horse wouldn't provide the individual what it is that they need. Okay, so um, in this case, the no pets policies don't apply. Um, we have to be able to allow those in even though we may have a no pet policy. There are no breed or size of animal restrictions under the ADA, but again, that's only applying to dogs and miniature horses. Um, and in housing, we can't require somebody with a bona fide service or emotional support animal to pay a pet deposit. Because we look at an emotional support animal or a service animal no different than, in my case, my wheelchair. The wheelchair is there to mitigate the fact that my legs are paralyzed. And without the wheelchair, I'm not going to get around, right? So that's the, the uh, basic effect of the service animal. Also required, I'm so sorry. See, I told you give me a microphone and a clicker and everything else can't keep up. Um, Let's see here, so some people are wanting to take pictures and that's totally fine, give you time to do that. Also required by the law, service a dog or horse must be under the handler's control. And I understand these are animals just like people, sometimes we get excited, sometimes we have a little lack of control, but it's momentary. And we have to be able to get ourselves back under control and if we have a, a service dog or an emotional support animal, it's our job to get that animal right back under control too, if they just happen to see a squirrel or something like that. Um, must be house trained. I mean, okay, you know, if an animal is sick or has something, freaks out or something, has a, a rare accident, that's one thing. But if an animal comes into our business, our hotel or wherever uh, and is obviously not house trained, then we can ask that person to take the animal out. And we also must require that it does not pose a direct threat to the health and safety of those around us. What about individuals who just don't like animals? They're afraid of dogs, um, this kind of thing. Maybe they're allergic to the dog hair. Well, then we need to work on accommodating them as well. We need to try to keep the animal away from that individual as much as possible. But the point is we want all individuals to enjoy our spaces as much as they possibly can. Um, so we would just try to work with each of those individuals. We've talked about some of the things that some service animals can provide, alerting individuals that are deaf or hard of hearing, depending noises, maybe danger, it could be traffic, maybe people are approaching them. Alerting somebody who has epilepsy that they are about to have a seizure to get them to sit in a uh, safe, quiet place. Um, picking items up off the floor, pulling a chair, helping to push a person in a, uh, a chair up an incline. And then we have emotional support animals. They're defined as companion <coughs> animals that provide a therapeutic benefit to an individual who has a mental or psychiatric disability. Now their care provider, psychiatrist, soci social worker, um, those individuals that are intimately familiar with their clients would be the ones to be able to write that letter showing the connection or the nexus between the individual with the disability and their legitimate need for their emotional support animal. The person requiring an emotional support animal needs to have a verifiable disability and that goes to that nexus. So for instance, um, where would be the point in my having a guide dog for an individual who has low vision or is blind when I don't have that particular impairment yet, right? So my guide dog request, excuse me, my request for accommodation via a guide dog for somebody who has a visual impairment would not match my disability. So I would expect that to be denied, right? Common needs for an emotional support animal, common disabilities that people suffer are severe depression, generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and there are several, several others out there as well. Who here works in, I mean, you have to be in the business of visitors or you wouldn't be here, but is it, is it hospitality? Is it uh, food and drink? Is it um, tourist stops? 
give me an idea of, of where you guys are and what type of animals you're seeing. Hotel, just raise your hand. Hotel, okay. Restaurant, tourist attraction, visitor attraction. Okay, so we've run the gamut. Um, how many of you have encountered a negative experience with a service animal or an emotional support animal? Okay, so that might be why we have so many people in the room here. Um, that's okay. I noticed in the prayer we were going to pray and talk about difficult people, and I'm the first speaker. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> she does know me better than I thought. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But the bottom line is just remember that a support, emotional support animal um, or assistance animal, sometimes they're called, and a service animal, they serve a purpose. Um, doesn't mean that somebody with a disability can't be a turkey, you know, because all individuals can sometimes be turkeys. Um, I just hope that when that turkey approaches me, I'm able to take a couple of deep breaths and ask them how it is that I might assist them and point them in the direction that they need to go to get to whatever it is that they've come to Knoxville to achieve. Now I can tell you one interesting thing that has popped up lately. We got um, our animal control individuals got contacted by a person that's about to move to this area, I think he said, um, East Tennessee, Knoxville, Sevierville area. And he has a service animal that is a wolf hybrid. Yeah, so I worked with my law department, my um, law enforcement individuals. We did some research and everything, and we simply won't recognize that as a service animal because of the half wolf part is listed as a class one dangerous animal. Um, so I suppose now we wait until he heads north and he lands in one of our communities, and then we will have to deal with that when it happens. But um, as far as recognizing that, we've let him know that the city is not going to recognize that as a service animal just because, okay? Um, I, and I know we're out of time. We have such limited time today, but if you have any questions, I have just a couple of moments to entertain them, maybe one minute. Questions? <laughs> okay. No, I'm sorry if I gave you that impression. You can certainly ask if that individual, or ask the individual if that is a pet or a service animal, and if they say, well, it's an emotional support animal, then only thing you can do, you cannot inquire about the disability. So, um, as long, here's my rule about that. Um, if somebody comes in to our facility and they're not acting a fool, I would not question the animal's presence, but if they begin to act a fool, you know, they're becoming a distraction to the others that are there, or there are some complaints maybe about how the animal smells, it's not kept well, and that kind of thing, then I would have to approach and ask that question. And if they say, you know, it's, a, it's my service animal, and that's all you can ask me, I'm gonna ask them what tasks has that service animal been trying to perform for them. And they should be able to tell me um, you know, so as long as they're keeping the animal, it's, ke it's clean and not nasty. Um, it doesn't uh, make a mess, so to speak. It's behaving under that handler's control. I just let that person do their thing. Does that help? Okay. I think Brandy's in control of the question and answer. Um, we had a guest arrive with a service monkey, and um, they wanted to bring it to the breakfast area. And our only problem was is we had other guests who complained about it. Service monkey in what context? Um, a, a hotel or a restaurant? It was a hotel that has a continental breakfast. Okay. They claimed it as a service animal? Do you recall or an emotional support animal? I don't remember which one okay. they used. The only reason I'm asking is if you, it, the Department of Justice will only recognize a dog and a miniature horse in limited circumstances. So if you come to me with a service animal monkey, <coughs> does not meet the definition. Does not meet the definition. But if they call it an emotional support, it would? 
then that monkey better be on its best behavior, <laughs> better be house trained, better not poop on the floor. And in all defense, the monkey, it never came off of the person's shoulder. Sure. But it's just the other guests were I understand. upset. I understand. This is another situation where something benefits one group of people and another group of people just doesn't really understand it. And so we often fear or hate what we don't understand. Thank you. Um, you said that they don't have to be on a leash if they come in? They have to be under the handler's control. Now in some circumstances, for instance, I have some friends that are quadriplegic, so they don't have full use of their arms or legs and their manual dexterity is very limited. So it might be difficult for them to hold a traditional leash, you know, or a leash that's retractable. So they might need a leash that they can slip their hand in and maybe wrap it around their arm once or twice. Or I have a friend who has a service animal, that dog's never more than five feet beyond her reach. So that is technically under her control because that animal is so well trained. Does that make sense? Well, if they have a, an animal that they're, care, they're able to walk, but they're just carrying this animal like under their arm, and are they allowed to go to the food bar with that animal under that arm? A service animal and an emotional support animal um, is allowed to go wherever in the public any of us can go in the public, restaurants, hospitals, that kind of thing. Um, there will be people that would say health codes mandate no animals in this space. Animals can't go in food prep areas. Um, I would not really appreciate the dog under the arm. I might, you know, be a little cautious. I'd try to figure out a strategic way to offer to help her fill her plate or something to keep the dog at arm's length from the buffet, that kind of thing. Um, but technically, if it's under that person's control, it would be okay under the law. <clears throat> uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I work in a motel. And the problem that we find is everybody that comes in has a service dog. Mm -hmm. and they're not, really, you see them coming out the door with every kid, every person to take them out to the bathroom. They don't, and, and you can't ask them anything, but everybody has a service animal, and that's why I'm here today to find out what we can do about that. I understand. I, you could maybe talk to your legislators on changing that ADA and tightening up that law. That's the only thing I know to do. And, you know, if you think about it, um, when, when, this was, when this came out and it was civil rights law, you've got people with disabilities here who have never been able to enter a government building or never been able to get on a public transit vehicle, never been able to vote, never been able to go to the movie of their choice or a hotel and stay um, as they like because it wasn't accessible. So you had people with disabilities and those that advocated for them want moon, want everything, right? Then you had legislators and, and lobbyists on this side didn't want to give us a thing, right? So in the end, when it all came together just before 1990 and the law was signed in, what we had was this colossal meeting in the middle. So people with disabilities didn't get everything they wanted, and the people that were against doing this, thinking it was gonna bankrupt the entire nation and that kind of thing, didn't get everything that they wanted. So in the middle is where we've landed, and the ADA is a bare minimum. We can always do better, right, than what's minimally required. But when it comes to individuals with service animals and emotional support animals, just like with employees with accommodations, I handle all employee accommodations for our 1,600 employees at the city in Knoxville. They thank God don't need them all at the same time, but, but every single situation is, is looked upon a, on a case-by-case -case basis. So I can't apply exactly what we worked out for this individual's accommodation to this individual because they're different people with different needs. So maybe one more, and then I know I'm over time. Okay. Uh, we work with the public transit department, trolley department here in Pigeon Forge. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, animal that's a service animal, or they say it's a service animal or an emotional support animal, they're in close proximity with a lot of passengers, and we have a lot of times where they're constantly barking or growling at people. Would that still be considered under control? Nope. And you, you can certainly say, ma'am or sir, I need you to get your service animal 
under control. And if it continues to bark or growl, I'm going to have to let you out at this next stop. And she can then get out at that next stop and hopefully get the animal calmed down. And then the next Charlie that comes along, pick her back up, she's on her journey. But you absolutely have every right to, to ensure that others have just as enjoyable of a ride on the trolley as anybody else, right? Okay. Okay. So, um, with emotional support animals, pretty gray area that we're all going to struggle with. Mm -hmm. It says that the person requiring an ESA should have a verifiable disability, i.e., letter from medical provider that matches the need for the ESA. Mm -hmm. That letter is ideal. We are limited to two questions. How do we acquire that letter? This particularly comes along in housing more often than not. Um, some people may carry with them in their wallet or purse, you know, something because frankly if I had an ESA and it wasn't clear as to why I would need that, I would probably prefer that I had that just to help you and me understand and we can, you know, get about our business and I share with you what my dog's for or what my animal's for and then we just move on, you know, so that it's primarily needed in housing, like where they have no pet, absolutely no pet policy. So in an apartment complex with a no pet policy, a person with a service animal or an emotional support animal is going to be allowed to apply for that housing and then they're seeking what's called a reasonable modification to the policy of no pets. And that modification to that policy is to allow that individual to have that emotional support animal there um, because it mitigates his or her disability. But when it's not obvious, if I can't tell you, you know, hey, this animal is, is here to help my severe anxiety or whatever, if I'm not able to tell you or willing to tell you that, then, and it's not obvious why I would need that ESA, then definitely you can say, you know, just because you're seeking a reasonable accommodation in housing, I need to be able to verify the disability and the need for your emotional support animal. And then they would provide that letter. So if that question number two is not properly answered, I could segue into? You could potentially. I, I would limit the questions just because um, we're in the business of business. <laughs> you know, we want customers and, and we want them to come back and share an experience at our place that was positive. But absolutely, if somebody is just wearing you out, that animal is behaving terribly, it stinks, it's not had a bath, you saw a flea jumping on it, that kind of thing, then absolutely you can tell service animal or emotional support animal handler to say, look, we want you to visit our business, but you're going to have to leave the animal outside or come back at another time when you can control it, when it's not fleas and stuff like that. Last question right here, and okay. then will you stick around to sure. answer more questions towards the end? Sure. Thank you very much. If uh, a business owner asks the question of what tasks is the dog, or in your horse, <laughs> uh, uh, trained to perform, mm -hmm. or if, that per if the business owner feels like that animal is a direct threat to health or safety, and, and, ask, and you know, not satisfied with the answers, they don't know what the tasks are, it's a direct threat, and ask that person to leave the animal or not enter and that person is combative, do you have recommendations on what the next steps would be? Call the popo. Yeah. <laughs> and hope, hope they're trained in how to handle situations like that. So um, I train all the KPD recru recruits that come in on ADA, people with disabilities, and, and these kinds of issues. So hope they're trained and hope the media doesn't show up. Yeah, there you go. So, thank you guys for having me. Thank you so much, Devin. That was very informative. Still a little confusing because it is a confusing topic. So we'll continue to work together as a community to answer these questions. And of course, in our world that we live in here in Sevier County, we are all about tourism, and every tourist carries with them a phone, a camera, and we're always, uh, you know, worried about those viral videos. So to that, uh, we have invited a special speaker here today and to help us kind of deal with some of those PR nightmares. 
Lauren Miller is with Moxley Carmichael, and she's been with them since 2007. During her tenure, Lauren has built relationships with the media, key community leaders, and partners across East Tennessee. Lauren leverages these relationships with her expertise in the industry and passion for community to deliver effective communication activities for her clients. In addition to providing counsel and strategic planning for long-term goals, Lauren implements communication strategies and oversees day-to-day -day media relations and public relations activities for such clients as Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Summit Medical Group, and Cherokee Distributing Company, among others. Lauren earned a degree in public relations from the University of Florida in 2007. She serves as a United Way of Greater Knoxville Young Leader and as a member of Public Relations Society of America and East Tennessee Economic Council. She is an Oak Ridge, Tennessee native and resides in Knoxville with her husband, John, and her two dogs, Chloe and Pets. So will you please help me welcome Lauren Miller. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's tricky for all of us. Thank you all so much for having me here today. I wish I could say that I had some um, tricks up my sleeve, but all I'm going to be able to do is help you navigate based on the law that Stephanie has already talked to us about what to do when problems arise. Um, this is a beautiful service animal from Smoky Mountain um, Service Dogs. Some of you may be familiar with that organization. And don't we wish that they were all this well behaved and well trained and uh, identifiable, but we realize that's not the case and that's why we're here today. Uh, uh, yes, I am Lauren Miller, the Director of Client Services. Uh, Moxley Carmichael is a full-service public relations firm in Knoxville. We're very involved in uh, the region, including here in Sevier County. So I will do a quick plug, if you'll uh, forgive me, but I want to make sure you're all invited. We are helping with the opening of the new Dave & Buster's in Sevierville. They're opening on Monday, you know, for visitors and tourists and everyone, but they want to make sure that the community has a, a chance to experience them. And so if you haven't already received the invitation, there is a VIP event this Thursday evening um, at six o'clock, free food, free, free drinks, free gameplay. They would love everyone who lives and works in this area to get to experience it first. Um, I have a bunch of um, invitations here that you're welcome to take to your friends, family, um, colleagues, employees, so um, we'd love to see you there. Uh, we are a full service public relations firm and so uh, it means we do all the things on this list and unfortunately the last one is crisis communication and I wish I didn't have as much experience in that as I do, but I do, so here we go. Um, service animals in the news. Uh, we see this every day. There are a lot of headlines that are confusing and frustrating. Um, service animals and emotional support animals aren't the same thing, experts say. That still makes it difficult for a business owner, even if they're not the same thing, uh, because of, as we learned, the questions that you can and can't ask. Um, Spirit Airlines accused of forcing a woman to flush her hamster. This is the nightmare you don't want to wake up to. Um, <laughs> clearly, there were issues at play there because um, they did not direct this woman to flush her hamster and the fact that she did shows that there were some issues on her end <laughs> um, despite what she thought the airline was telling her about whether or not she could bring a hamster on the flight. Um, that's a good example of even though you and your staff may do everything right, you may have a customer who um, wants to blame someone else for a situation and you're going to have to deal with that in the news. Um, this man wrongfully removed from American Airlines flight, that was an interesting situation because he didn't have the animal, he was sat next to a woman with a service dog, was allergic, um, they tried to move him to another seat, there was some confusion around moving him to another seat, finally when they were going to move the woman with the dog, the captain deplaned him and then there were accusations that the captain was actually being racist. So this is where things can also spiral out of control. Uh, Publix, no dogs in grocery carts, including service pets. This is an interesting example of Publix is not saying that you can't bring your service animals in. They're just saying they don't belong in the carts. And that is a policy that they're allowed to keep because the service animals do, by nature do not need to be in the grocery cart. So this is a way for them to um, draw a line in terms of 
we're not disallowing service animals, we're not disallowing ser emotional support animals, but we are being very, very clear about our policies in terms of the health and safety standards in our stores so that your, the animal is still under the control of the owner, the animal is still there to perform the tasks they need to, but if you just want your, you know, your dog, I, hey, I love bringing my dog to dog-friendly patios. I love bringing my dog to dog-friendly stores, but my dog does not need to ride in the front of the shopping cart and lick the produce. Um, this is an example of a woman who does have a mini horse as a service animal. As Stephanie said, that is admissible under ADA in certain circumstances. I found it interesting, I didn't realize one of the reasons is because mini horses can live up to 35 years. So for some people that is an important relationship rather than a dog that may have a lifespan of 10 to 15 years, they have a relationship with a service animal who knows them and is trained to take care of them that can live for 35 years. So I think that helps us understand a little bit why a mini horse is an option. It's not just because people like horses, although I think we all find mini horses very adorable. There's a, there's a reason behind it. Um, this is a really interesting example. This is in Texas. This was a um, service animal that was with a United States military veteran for his PTSD and injuries and he was going to be um, not allowed into a festival that included that featured rattlesnake handlers because they were concerned that it was a direct threat because they were they thought if the dog did not know how to be around snakes and snake handlers it could cause an issue where then the snake would bite someone and we understand that concern that caution but in that situation it was deemed that that was not a direct threat because this was a trained service dog and he was needed to be allowed into that festival uh, American Airlines updates support and service animal many horses still fly free that's just a, a fun headline um, <laughs> Uh, Walmart is another um, major retailer that's cracking down on policies because they've seen a lot of social media um, complaints, as I think some of you have alluded to, not from the people who want to bring the animals in, but from the other customers who are asking, why is there a monkey defecating in the sporting goods section? Um, you know, they see a lot of tweets like that of people saying, come on, you know, or my wife just told me she left Walmart without finishing shopping for our groceries because there was a woman carrying a snake around her neck and she was scared. Um, so Walmart is trying to address that we need to still allow service animals, emotional support animals, but we're going to be really clear about our policies um, so that we are dissuading people who just want to bring animals in because Frankly, we know there are unfortunately people who are going to be dishonest or um, inconsiderate around individuals who truly need service animals because that's what Stephanie talked about. These are, these are a true need, but there are people who are going to be dishonest about that or um, cavalier about it because they just prefer to have their animal with them. We're gonna try and dissuade those folks. And to that point, um, there are a lot of states that are trying to add laws to crack down on fines that um, would punish people who misrepresent their animals as service dogs when they're not. That being said, that still does not um, change the ADA uh, requirements that Stephanie outlined where right now you still can only ask those two questions. Is this, uh, is this dog a trained service dog for a disability and what is the dog trained to do? But we're, um, they're hoping that some of these laws again will just dissuade people who are trying to take advantage of the situation. So first things first, understand the law and follow the law. Again, PR does not change that. Um, set your policies and procedures. I think this is the most important part. Do you have in your businesses your own understanding of how you're going to handle when folks come in with an animal? Do you have, have you trained your staff and do you have written policies? That's exactly what Walmart and Publix and some of these large retailers are doing that I think we can all take a page from. Because if you don't have a policy in place, how will your staff consistently implement that? And how will you be able to be sure that you're following the law and showing compassion to paying customers, right? Um, you need to consider the situations, like we said, with service animals, emotional support animals, and pets. And so you might have different steps in your policy depending on how those questions are answered, right? Um, just because you have to allow service animals doesn't mean that you, can, you don't have to have a policy that says we don't allow pets. Of course, many businesses do. 
You just need to be very clear about that policy. It's the same thing as in school. If, you, if a teacher had a rule on the wall and you broke that rule, you knew you were in trouble. If you go somewhere and you get in trouble for something you didn't realize as a rule, that's when people get very upset and very defensive and are gonna try and find a way to get out of trouble. If you're clear about the rules on the front end, then I think you're gonna find that most people, there's still gonna be exceptions, most people are going to be understanding about following the rules you have in place. You may wanna consult with legal counsel about your animal policies. So if you, if you do decide I'm gonna do a written policy and I'm gonna train my staff, I, I think it's wise to consult with an attorney and make sure that the way you've written that is um, in compliance with the ADA. Um, and yeah, like I said, train your staff, post written policy, so that might mean on your website, might mean on your Facebook page, if these are um, places that people look for information, again, make it clear on the front end. Again, so there are gonna be folks who, if they look on your website or your Facebook page and they see a clear no pets policy, they're just gonna go to a different place. If they don't see that and they come all the way down to your business with Fifi in tow, they're gonna be frustrated. Um, also consider signage on site for that reason. Um, as we discussed, everyone's a reporter, so this is another thing to keep in mind, is any customer or bystander could take photos or videos of, how, of what's happening in your business or how you're interacting with a customer. They can post to social media, they can call the media, they can call a reporter, and they could share it on their blog or uh, another way that they disseminate news. Um, and they could write letters or file other complaints um, or online reviews. So we know that this is what we're up against, right? Is you, uh, in your interactions with folks with animals, keep in mind that anyone could be watching and paying attention. And so keep in mind that you want to show, and we're gonna talk about this, compassion even in enforcing your policies. Now, one thing I will mention, if you are a, pr a private business on private property, you can uh, tell media that they're not allowed to film on property, right? That is, that is your um, prerogative as a business owner. That being said, there's nothing to say that that reporter can't cross the street and stand on public property and film your business from a distance. So keep that in mind in, in terms of when we start talking about news media, you don't have to allow them to film on private property if you are a private business, but they can film from a distance on public property and still do a story about your business. You can't uh, avoid that. All right, so the three C's. This is my, my best recommendation and how you write your policies and how you train your staff is be communicative, be consistent, and be compassionate. If you keep these three things in mind, I think you're gonna find that you can deal with most situations. Communicative in the sense of, again, tell people what your policies are, make sure that it's very clear what your policies are, and in enforcing the law, because just as you may have um, confusion or complaints from folks who have those animals, you may have confusion or complaints from people who don't have animals. Like Stephanie said, they don't understand the law. Um, there's a lot of people who that's not something that they have needed to understand. So if your policies reinforce that you're also um, allowing these service animals because it is the law um, that will help other customers understand as well. Be consistent. Consistency is key. When you start making exceptions for people one way or the other is where those policies really don't hold any weight. Um, but you be compassionate in how you approach this. And, and when I say compassion, that also means, again, back to consistency, you don't need to make exceptions for people. Be consistent, but be compassionate in how you explain those policies, explain how you're enforcing um, the law that at which you, you must uh, adhere to. The other C, unfortunately, is crisis. So that's when you start to get the negative reviews, the news stories, the social media posts and comments. And, and like we said, we know them. we're dealing with opinions and anger and other emotions, sometimes on both sides, and a lot of misinformation at times, right? So how do you start to deal with that when you have that negativity? Again, keep in mind, communicative, consistent, compassionate. Avoid no comment. If you guys are watching the news and somebody comes out of the courthouse steps and they've been accused of a crime and the reporter asks, did you do it? And they say no comment, what's your first assumption? <laughs> this is all too often how a business deals with a crisis is we're just gonna ignore it and it'll go away then the assumption for a lot of people, and a lot of people you may not be talking to, potential customers that you don't even know are paying attention is, they're guilty, 
I don't want to do business with them. <coughs> so avoid no comment. Be proactive and correct misinformation. The Spirit Airlines example of the woman who said she was told to flush her hamster down the toilet, they did a good job of coming out right away and saying, we did not tell this guest, nor any guest at any time, to flush or harm or cause injury to any animal. They were very adamant about the fact that that was a blatant lie. And that's important. If you can confirm that there's misinformation being spread, you need to correct it. And maybe there has been an issue in your business with an animal. Um, still, correct misinformation um, that, that may not be at the crux of it, but if they're saying, well, this, this business had a sign up that said, no pets, and, um, and then they took it down. And you said, no, here it is, here's the sign. Correct misinformation. If you don't correct it, no one else is gonna correct it for you, and that will continue to be shared, and, um, and people will believe it before you can um, get a handle on it. So correct misinformation on the front end. Um, provide complete and honest information as available, confirmed, and appropriate to share. People want to show, see that you are being honest about the situation and you're sharing what happened. Again, avoiding that no comment. Um, you may want to consult legal counsel if, if it's at that point where you think that that might be necessary um, to make sure that you didn't break any laws, that you weren't um, in violation of the American Disabilities Act. Um, and so as you talk to the public, as you address these negative reactions, you may want to emphasize the law and your established policies. You may need to say, this is the American Disabilities Act, this is what we're enforcing, this is why, and let the law speak for you. There, there's no need for you to defend what you're doing when you're following the law. There's no need for you to defend a policy that's been in place that was clear to your customers. Um, you may want to use a written statement on the front end to ensure consistency. Um, I think that's really helpful. Write out what your, your reply is going to be. So if you've gotten a, um, a call from a reporter, if you have a negative post on Facebook and you want to reply, I think it's helpful to have it in writing. It makes sure that you're all on the same page, that if, if again, you're concerned that there are legal issues, you can have a um, legal counsel review that statement. Um, that puts everyone on the same page. But if you're going to do interviews, if you're going to speak to the public, use a leader in your organization as a spokesperson. Um, I think that's common sense, but this isn't a time for the employee, the frontline person, the cashier, or the ticket taker, or the, or the um, bus boy, or whoever you know, this may be. They do important work, but it's not, even if they were the one who interacted with the animal, this is not a time for them to defend themselves. You need to speak from the level of the organization and the policies that you've set. Um, you may need to provide background information. A cr in a crisis, information moves really, really fast. And so sometimes we get too focused on the incident itself, and we forget you may have a reporter working on your story who has no idea anything about your business. They don't understand what you do. They don't understand how long you've been in the community. They don't understand uh, information about your location that may affect the story. You may need to provide them with some background information when you talk to them, say, I'm, I want to talk to you about the issue, but also let me provide you with some information about my business. Because um, when they're moving really fast in a crisis, you don't want to create more headaches for yourself where not only now are you involved in a negative story about a service animal, but they've miscategorized your business and say that you're a restaurant when really you're a hotel. It's, it's, those mistakes can happen really quickly when we're dealing with timely information. Um, you don't have to provide on-the-spot interviews. I said avoid no comment, but there's nothing wrong with saying thank you for your call, let me know what you're interested in, what time you may want to do an interview, and let me get back to you. Because you do not need to put, be put in the situation of you've not even seen the Facebook post. Suddenly a reporter's calling you, I saw a Facebook post that says you kicked out a veteran with his service dog. Is that true? You have no idea what they're talking about. That is not the time to do an on-the-spot interview, and it's perfectly fine to say, thank you for this information. I need to look into this. Can I have your contact information? Can I call you back? Now you need to follow up, but you do not need to provide an on-the-spot interview. And some, inter some reporters, that's their job, are going to pressure you to answer. But can you just tell me if it's true or not? 
just real quick, just before, can't you tell me whether it's true or not? Say, I appreciate your call. Let me get some more information and call you back. Do not be pressured into doing on-the-spot interviews, especially when you do not know the full story. You need to do your homework, you need to talk to your staff, and you need to make sure that you understand what happened before speaking publicly. You do not have to share, and you, and you shouldn't, private, informations about cus private information about customers or team members. So I say provide complete and honest information about the situation. That doesn't mean you have to provide these things. You don't provide information protected by law. You don't have to provide proprietary company information. Um, for example, um, I've had situations with clients where they want to say, well, um, the, the media wants to say, well, can you tell us what security measures are in place to avoid an incident like this? Again, this isn't specific to service animals, but no, we're not going to tell the public where the security cameras are, what security procedures are in place, what, um, what policies our employees use when there is a threat to the company. Because by doing that, by sharing that proprietary information, we're putting our business at risk in the future because we've shared all our secrets. <laughs> so you do not have to share proprietary company information and it's okay to say when you're being asked questions about that. And you don't have to share details related to an open police investigation. I don't think there's many situations that are going to go that far, but it is perfectly fine to say, this is an open police investigation. Please refer your questions to the proper authorities. Once it's a police investigation, they should be the ones speaking to the issue. One more um, point about crisis communications and just in general, in case it's helpful, there's no such thing as off the record. Movies have made us all believe that there is such thing as talking to your buddy who works in the newspaper and say, let me tell you something off the record. There is no such thing. It's not true. If you are talking to a reporter, they have the right to report on anything and everything you say. One of the ways that I see that this gets tripped up, because there's not a lot of people who think I'm going to say something off the record and, and it'd be okay, is that reporters have a, um, and I work with reporters, I work with the media, they are, I, I love working with them and they do a lot of positive things, but they also have a job, right, which is reporting the story. So this is one of the techniques that a lot of reporters use, especially print reporters, which is to be asking questions and, you, and they have a tape recorder out or they have their notebook out, right, and you're answering the questions and then they just turn that tape recorder off and they close that notebook and they say, thank you so much for the interview, it was really good talking to you, and you let down your guard because you think the interview is over. And you say, well, this was, I'm really glad that you came out into this story, but oh, I was really worried that we were going to have to talk about X, Y, and Z. And suddenly, oh, there was an X, Y, and Z? I'm going to find out about X, Y, and Z. The, the interview is not a finite piece of time. If you're talking to a reporter, just keep in mind that's their job is to find a story, and they can report on whatever you say, even when the notebook is closed, even when the tape recorder is off. Um, keep in mind during a crisis, you want to make sure you have someone on your team assigned to monitoring the news and the social media and the reviews because as that information gets shared, you want to make sure that you understand <laughs> everywhere it's being shared in case you need to address it. And if you're not monitoring it, there may be places where you're not, um, you know, no one's going to call you. There are times as media continues to shrink, right, we know this is what's happening in newsrooms is that there are fewer and fewer reporters. It used to be a reporter would get a story and they would be assigned and they would you know, call multiple sources and they would learn as much as they could about that story. They're under a ton of deadline pressure right now. The news is 24 hours, everything breaks online fast. So they do a lot of what we call single source reporting, which is I'm a disgruntled customer, I call you, I say there's a problem and, I'm gonna, and that reporter says, great, I'm gonna run with that story. And um, the reporter should call you and get your side of the story, but if you're not looking, especially once that story hits of where other media might be picking it up and then talk, talking to that person and running similar stories, you might not see, uh, they might not always be calling you and you need to be proactive in finding out where the misinformation may be or, um, or opportunities to share your statement, so do that. Um, you also wanna keep in mind you need to train your staff to handle calls and in-person questions, um, both from your customers but also Media is not always going to know to ask for you as the business owner. So if media calls and they say, I've heard that this happened, I want to talk with someone, is your staff trained on how you want them to handle that call? Keep that in mind. They may not be. And sometimes um, there are situations even when, um, even when staff is told, hey, if media calls, 
you route it to me, we've seen situations where they think they're being, you know, um, they're well-meaning and suddenly they're giving an interview that you didn't know about. So make sure to train all of your staff. Um, as I mentioned, you want to correct or report false or slanderous information. So you want to correct misinformation, but when we start to talk about online reviews and social media posts, you guys have seen you can report if there is um, harassing language or slanderous information. Don't let those things go by. Um, you, you need to report those. You need to flag those. And um, Facebook, um, Google all have procedures in place to have posts taken down when they are deemed um, slanderous or offensive. Um, you want to enforce your social media policy. I hope all of you have a social media policy. This goes back to the same idea as the service animal policy. If you don't have it written, then people don't know and you're going to have trouble enforcing it. So in the, uh, on your Facebook page or on, uh, uh, in the about section or in more information, I would recommend having a policy that says we encourage open communication and dialogue, but if you use offensive language, harassing language, you will be removed from our page. I recommend having a policy in place. And you can find sample language online, have that in place. So then when you have someone who's cursing on your page, it's completely appropriate to delete that comment, ban them from the page, and then I recommend adding a post so your other customers see a comment has been removed from this thread because that person violated our social media policy by using offensive language. That's again being communicative and transparent so people know we're not deleting this comment just because we don't like it. This person is being offensive. We had a policy in place, they broke it, and so we're enforcing our rules. But don't, again, delete the negative comments just because you don't like them, right? That to um, customers is a big dissatisfier because they feel like you're just gaming the system so that people only see positive things and they don't know the truth. So if it's offensive, you can delete it. If not, you need to try and address those negative comments. So let's talk a little more about that. Consider sharing your statement, right, of what happened on your social media pages. Now, if you have a, a small issue with a person who, uh, around a service animal, media hasn't been called, it's not on your social media, I'm not telling you to write a statement and suddenly start you know, publicizing it yourself and calling more attention to something that nobody knew about. You don't have to do that. But if, if you're concerned that there have been, um, there's been discussion, there's been news, uh, coverage, people are talking on social media, consider sharing that statement as, as again, your, your main piece of uh, information, your response as to what the issue was and why you handled it the way you did. Um, so everyone's seeing the same message, it's consistent. Um, if there are questions or comments on your social media that you feel need to be addressed, I would respond to them and you know correct misinformation, show compassion, direct them to that statement. Um, as much as possible, you can just keep reinforcing that same message. This is why we handled things the way we did. But do not continue to discuss or argue. You're just going to go down a rabbit hole that you can't win on social media. It is perfectly fine as a business, I think, to listen to concerns, address them, but you don't need to continue to argue with someone on a post. Definitely don't respond to trolls. I know sometimes that's hard to tell the difference between a troll does everyone know what I mean by a social media troll? Okay, so a social media troll is someone who is on there just to be negative for the sake of being negative. Trolls often don't even live in this community. They don't even have understanding of the information or they just want to be a contrarian to make people mad. There are unfortunately people in this world, as we know, who just like to make other people mad. So sometimes you're gonna have negative comments you need to address. If you feel like it's someone who's a troll who is just <laughs> saying negative things for the sake of saying them, you don't have to address those. Um, don't answer hypothetical questions. I think that's an important part too is, it, well, what would happen if I came in with my dog? Would you kick me out too? There's no need for you to answer hypo hypothetical questions. As Stephanie said, every situation is different. Every person is different. And if you start trying to answer hypothetical questions, you are gonna get into trouble because there are too many uh, variables at play and suddenly you found yourself on a public forum stating a policy that you didn't mean to, saying, hey, I would allow or wouldn't allow, and suddenly you're, you're going to be held accountable to that. You don't have to answer hypothetical questions. It's fine to say, that's a hypothetical question. What I can tell you is that we're going to stay in compliance with the American Disabilities Act. We're going to enforce the policies of our business that are written on our website and posted on site, and we're going to be compassionate to those of our customers who have service animals who want to frequent our business. Uh, 
allow your patrons to weigh in and show support. This is an important part is a lot of you have loyal patrons and customers and a lot of times they will rise to the occasion to speak up on your behalf. So that's a lot of times where I say share your statement, answer questions, correct misinformation, um, be communicative, but also what you'll find a lot of times is that you'll have friends and patrons who will speak up for you and, and that speaks volumes. Let them do that as well. Most important thing is if you're truly in a crisis, media and the public want regular updates, updates during and after the crisis. That's the part a lot of people leave out. Um, if you are not giving updates as needed, there's, there's a, a, a void, right? If media is looking for a follow-up story and you're not giving them an update, they're gonna find someone else to talk to and it may not be the person you want them to talk to. It may be another disgruntled individual. Um, on social media, they're going, you know, someone's going to say, we don't know what's happening. People are going to start to give their own opinions. Be proactive in giving regular updates. And they want to know, the public wants to know, how are you going to proceed with the impact on customers, employees, vendors, or you may have other uh, stakeholder groups here or the community. So perhaps you do need to say, we've assessed our policy and we realize that we have some changes to make. And here's what we're going to do moving forward. We've updated our policy. We're training our staff. We brought in um, experts in the field who are going to help us understand how we can better work with individuals with service animals, and that's what we're doing moving forward. That's important because if you just try and get by the crisis and you don't say what the resolution was, people are going to assume there was no resolution and you don't have an opportunity to show that you're being proactive and caring about your customers and having the best experience moving forward. So like I said, report on the resolution, share any improvements or changes made. This is an opportunity maybe if there were customers who were frustrated or upset or uh, believed rumors, believed misinformation, you have an opportunity to win them back. Show your commitment to serving them and to your community and providing a space that is welcoming to people with disabilities, but also to all customers while following the law. So I would, whenever possible, think of this as an opportunity. Don't Stick your head in the sand because you think, oh, the news stories are over, we weathered that storm, we're gonna you know, move on to the next thing. You may have customers who have thought twice about your business because of a, uh, a headline they saw. Someone read the headline of Spirit Animal, or Spirit Animal, excuse me, Spirit Airlines tells a customer to flush her hamster and they think, well, I'm never flying Spirit Airlines again and they never look anything up. Spirit Airlines had to work very hard to continue to send the message of that was not accurate, this is what our policy is, this is how we do welcome service animals, to get the word out that that was wrong and win back customers who at first glance, at first headline, thought I'm not, I'm not flying with them anymore. So that is a quick rundown of some of the crisis communications recommendations. And we're going to skip Q&A because I took too much time. <laughs> but I'm will stay right I will stick around and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much for joining me. We appreciate you sticking to Lauren will stick around to answer any questions that you have for your, um, your business. At this time, I do have the privilege of introducing you to the, our last speaker. Dr. Megan Stinson is a Sevier County native and a physical therapist. After graduating from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, she obtained her doctorate of physical therapy from Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. Upon graduation, Dr. Stinson became active in the American Physical Therapy Association and the Tennessee Physical Therapy Association as the youngest executive committee member ever elected to a chairperson position. She served as the le legislative chair and political action committee co-chair for three years and then the ethics committee chair for one year. She was awarded as one of the 25 therapists across the nation as an emerging leader by the APTA. Now, Dr. Stinson also brings with her, and I would love to introduce you to Gretchen. Gretchen is a two-year-old giant schnauzer who has an incredible bond with her owner and an intense drive to work and take care of her family. She was purchased as a puppy by the Stinson family as a gift in 2017. Due to her typical breed characteristics, the Stinsons made the decision for formal obedience training. When she is not working, Gretchen enjoys attending schools, businesses, and seminars for service dog demonstrations and education. 
She also enjoys acting as a role model for younger service dogs in training. Gretchen currently holds two AKC titles as an AKC Canine Good Citizen and the more elite AKC Urban CGC, which Megan, I'm sure, will tell us about. She was one of the youngest dogs ever tested by her service dogs program to pass both and begin her work in the field. So please welcome Dr. Megan Stinson and Gretchen. Said thank you, Brandy, for um, that beautiful welcome. I appreciate that very much. So my name is Dr. Megan Stenson. Um, I've been a physical therapist for 12 years, and um, we're going to go through some of my family's history. Um, if you saw me walk into the room, um, you likely would not have assumed that this was my service dog, okay? Because I don't necessarily look like I need it, okay? So um, appearances can be a little deceiving sometimes. So one of the things that we like to teach on as well is that not all um, disabilities are visible to your eye, especially whenever you encounter customers or visitors that um, have a service animal. And I love you already, by the way. Um, oh, oh I, I love you. <laughs> thank I love you. Thanks. So um, a, lot of our, a lot of our discussion actually kind of overlaps, which is really kind of cool. Um, there's one discrepancy that I have based on her, but I'm going to defer to the expert on some of that. So, um, so let's see where we are here, and I have to look at my little PowerPoint. So Gretchen the Wonder Dog, as she is known around our area. Um, we do live in Sevier County. I'm the sixth generation on my family's farm. We live close to Bushes, and Chestnut Hill is, is where we are based out of. Um, <laughs> lay down, please. She's got grass allergies, too, so bless her. Gretchen, be professional. Thank you. <laughs> Good girl. Okay. Okay. So um, the Urban CGC title is another Canine Good Citizens title. And basically what that means is the dog has to be able to go into an urban setting. So a Canine Good Citizen is just a dog. Um, the test items, <laughs> she's being very unprofessional, I'm so sorry, um, include like a, someone approaching the dog um, without it becoming aggressive. Um, someone can come up and it's a really random question but I think it's more like a personal interaction but they actually ask can I can I brush your dog and the dog has to stand still while the person brushes it it's very strange but um, and then you have to be able to leave the dog with a stranger and the dog be calm and not panic and not have anxiety um, so that's for the basic um, AKC CGC the urban you actually have to go into an urban setting so we actually went to downtown Knoxville Market Square to do that testing and you have to go into a business that's dog friendly. You have to, um, the dog has to not react to noises in the city. Um, you have to stop at a crosswalk and when you stop the dog has to sit and stay until you start again. Um, obviously cannot be aggressive, cannot bark, cannot growl, all those things are big no-nos. Um, and they have to walk over various different surfaces so it was interesting. We actually walked around downtown Knoxville looking for one of those metal grates for her to walk across to, to make sure she didn't react. Um, and so one of the keys with training a good service dog is early socialization, and that's with people and with animals, and putting them in different situations that could potentially cause a response to give them opportunities to be corrected. So, um, and we'll talk about later, she's still a dog. She's great, she's a wonderful dog, but she's still a dog. Okay, and that's something that if you have someone who is a service dog handler, especially if the service dog has truly been trained well, um, that handler should have respect for that fact at all times as well. So that's a responsible service dog handler. Okay, so I didn't know exactly what you were going to go over. She did tell me you're going to go over some stuff, and this is where this is where the trainers tell me is a difference because they tell me that um, the ESAs don't have public access to food places. So, but I'm going to defer to our expert on this one, okay? So, I agree with that. Okay. An ESA can't technically go out into all the public locations that a service animal can. Right. It's super confusing. It is very super confusing, correct. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so a therapy dog is a dog that's trying to provide affection and comfort to other people in a controlled setting. So it's my dog, I love it, but it goes and loves on everybody else. It makes everybody else feel better, okay? An ESA, or emotional support animal, is a companion animal that a medical provider states may give emotional benefit companionship and can help ease certain men, um, mental disabilities. It does not have public access by law. We just talked about that, so again, deferring to our expert here for that. 
Um, and then a service dog. So here's the big thing with the service dogs. So it's an animal dog or apparently miniature horse, which I learned today. That's pretty cool. Um, and I'm like, 35 years, that's awesome. Because once these reach a certain age, you have to retire them because they can no longer work effectively and it's not fair to them. Um, but it's deemed medically necessary by a licensed healthcare provider. So it's not just that it provides some benefit, but medically it's really needed to be there to help that person function. And it must be trained to perform a specific task job or function. So it can't just be there to lay on their lap and lick them and look cute, okay? Or to walk beside them and lay down or whatever. It has to be trained to perform a task. So key word here is it has to be trained. So um, does that mean it has to be a professional trainer? No. Sometimes unfortunately not. Um, but it must be trained to perform a specific something, okay? And it cannot be something that the dog would naturally perform. So you get upset the dog comes and loves on you that's really not it performing a trained task. That's just it being a dog that loves you and it knows you're upset. So there's a difference between those. It is protected by law for public access. She already went over that. Um, it is viewed as medical equipment. So if you would not walk up to someone and say, hey, can I turn your oxygen tank off for a second? I mean, I know that you need it to live and breathe, but can I just reach down and just play with that a little? So if you wouldn't do that, you shouldn't walk up and even talk to a service dog. Okay, so that's a, a decently good way of kind of putting those two together because it's not, she's not a pet. I love her. She's spoiled rotten. She's treated better than most people that I know. But at the same time, she's not my pet. She doesn't get treats all the time. She doesn't get to do this and do that now. She does have off time where she's just a dog and we play and the boys play with her. But when she's working, she's not a pet. And it is viewed completely differently. Okay, um, she gets treats <laughs> only for training purposes. The rest of the time she gets dog food and we even withhold food sometimes for a feeding to get her to perform a difficult task with treats. So again, she is a very specific tool. Um, okay, she already went over this, thank you. There is no formal service dog registration, registration, excuse me. There's a U.S. service dog registration, an American service dog registration, and the service dog registration of Idaho, and all these things. They're all scams. They're just trying to get people's money, trying to take them under the table or whatever, you know, like she said. Um, and I've had businesses that say, do you have her formal service dog registration? No, I don't because it's, there's no such thing. And then we have to provide some education, and then we have to be a little stern, and then we have to pull up the ADA laws on our phone. Um, our particular training program because of this did actually start making little IDs which unfortunately you can also buy on Amazon for your dog that have nice little watermarks and all. Um, but they did provide us with a card that says look if you run into any trouble here it is the ADA laws are on the back if you need it flash it otherwise they should never ask anyway. Okay. Um, <laughs> a letter from an internet doctor does not count as a licensed medical provider saying that you need a service dog. Um, one of the biggest issues we have, I love taking her places, I love talking to people, I love educating people, but when someone walks up to me and says, oh yeah, my brother's got a service dog, this guy on the internet sent him a letter and he just takes it wherever he wants to go because he thought that'd be cool. <coughs> <laughs> or yesterday, actually yesterday, um, a lady walked up to tell me that one of her family members has a very aggressive dog. It's a very large aggressive dog. And her family member thought it would be fun to buy a vest and get an ID card and take it places so that they, he could see the reaction of when people, of, of people when it barked and growled and snapped and snarled. That did not go well. <laughs> um, yeah, that's those. Yeah, so we, we had a very long discussion whether they wanted to sit there and listen to it or not. I was like, yeah, you started this. So. Okay, so like she said, um, a training for the service dog is unfortunately not mandated. This is something that irritates service dog handlers because um, you, can, you can have a dog, you can train it to perform a specific task, and it's a service dog. I mean, legally right now it is. That doesn't mean it should be. Okay, just because it's a good dog does not mean it needs to be a service dog. Um, one of the things that we harp on all the time, and she actually mentioned all of them, we call it the three D's. So it cannot be anything, any of the three D's. So disruptive, so barking, somebody asked about the trolley, barking, growling, snarling, snapping. Um, she does 
itch because of grass allergies, but if she did it constantly, I wouldn't have her here today, okay, because that's disruptive to what you guys are trying to learn. Disgusting. So housebroken, all right? If she came up here, oh, I'm the perfect service dog, right in the middle of the podium, probably not the best thing, okay? So this baby here has gone for 12 hours while I was in the hospital and not used the bathroom because she knows that's not what she's supposed to do. Um, and then again, dangerous. So at no point should a service dog ever, ever show aggression, ever. So say dark night, strange man comes running up to me in a hoodie. She should not react to that because she is a service dog. Does it mean I wouldn't want her to? Maybe not necessarily. Okay, cause we don't, nobody likes that, but just saying. And I know I'm running like crazy over. Yeah, Brady's back there, come on. Okay, ideally, <coughs> They should meet all of these things, okay? However, it's still a dog and not a robot. That's something really big to remember. They all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Um, at the end of the day, it's still a dog, okay? It needs to be a well-behaved dog. It needs to be a well-groomed dog. It doesn't have to have a fancy haircut, but it needs to be clean. You, you would love to run in, run out, and be done. If 15 people try to stop and talk to you about your dog because it's great and wonderful in every way and they know somebody else who has a service dog, and, you know, I've had four miniature schnauzers in my life, never seen a giant, these are things we get. That's great. I love you. I love people. I love to talk about it. I love to educate, but sometimes I don't have time. Um, say fake service dogs make it very difficult on us, too. Um, if we have to go to a restaurant, I usually try to call ahead out of respect for them. Um, had one place that had a German Shepherd dog that came in as a service dog. I say that lovingly. Um, growled at all the servers, ate off of the owner's plate, jumped up on the table next to it, ate their food. Um, and so when we, when we came to the restaurant, they were not excited to see us. It's just, I mean, they weren't. It's a bad experience. There were so many hands that went up whenever she asked if there were bad experiences with service dogs or emotional support animals. And so it makes it harder on us. Because again, this is not the life I chose. I mean, I was gonna be a, you know, actually I was gonna be a veterinarian, but then I decided to be a PT. Um, but I was gonna grow up and get married and have kids and live on a farm and sit by the fire every night and, you know, drink tea with my husband and live a long time and have the perfect kids that were perfect at everything. It's just not what God had planned for me. So um, it makes it hard on us too. Please be kind. Again, like we said before, it's not easy to have this, especially when it's not something you were looking forward to. Please don't ask to pet the dog. The dog is medical equipment. We already talked about the oxygen. Had a friend, went to Dairy Queen. Somebody came up and started petting the dog um, or at least talking to her about petting the dog. Dog missed an alert. She had a seizure, busted her head, ended up with an ER bill. Oh. Lots of bad stuff happened. Um, it is also, you really don't need to interact with the dog. So if the dog service handler is approaching you, don't go, oh, yes, I'm here. Because again, that's distracting the dog and they could miss an alert, okay? Even if it's really pretty and it, you really want to touch it, just don't do it, please. Um, okay, what we do appreciate is do not assume that because you cannot see the disability, it doesn't exist. It's one of my main points here, okay? Um, just because it's not visually, obviously, right there doesn't mean it's not there. Compliment the dog. Hey, your dog's very well behaved. I appreciate that. Compliment the handle. I can see you put a lot of work into this dog. Thank you. Okay. Um, ignore the dog. So, again, don't. Okay. Um, speak to the handlers if the dog's not present during the business interaction. This is so important because we want to know that your customer service is here, not here. I and mean, we appreciate that. But at the same time, if I came to you to buy cupcakes, I don't want you to be talking about the dog the whole time I'm trying to tell you what I need for cupcakes or my room accommodations or my order or whatever, okay? Again, please be kind. It's hard, it, it is. And like I said, fake service dogs make it harder. It makes it hard on you guys, um, but just try to be compassionate. All right, thank you. I know I ran way over, I think we all have. So I love you all. Thank you for allowing us to be here.